My name is Matt Friedman. I'm the CEO of an organization called the Mekong Club. We're based in Hong Kong. I'm going to do a talk today that's on modern slavery. I'll be talking about human trafficking. I'll be kind of initially outlining uh, kind of what is human trafficking and modern slavery in its most uh, basic form. I'll talk about how this became an issue associated with the private sector. And then I'll talk specifically about finance and banking, and then I'll end up my talk after that. So to begin with, when most people think about human trafficking, they think about the picture in the top left-hand corner for good reason. There are 4.8 million women and girls in forced prostitution around the world. My first exposure to this it was about uh, 30 years ago. I was living and working in Nepal. I was a public health officer. And at that time, we were finding girls that were 12, 13 years old who were HIV positive. Couldn't understand what was going on. It's a very conservative culture. So we went to go and interview the women and the girls. Um, when we got there, what we heard was pretty much the same story over and over again. And it went something like this. Human trafficker, guy around 20 years old, would go into a village. He'd flash a bunch of money around. He wanted people to think he was rich. He'd then go around saying, I'm looking for a wife. I don't want an urban wife, I want a village wife. He'd find a girl 12, 13 years old, befriend her, and then go to the family and say, I'd like to marry your daughter. They're thinking, wow, he's rich, he's handsome, he's gonna take care of our daughters, he's gonna take care of us. A couple of days later, they actually have a wedding ceremony. The entire community is there. After that, he goes to the family and says, I'm gonna take your daughter to Kathmandu, but don't worry, I'll be back in three months. But that isn't what's going to happen. Instead of taking her to Kathmandu, he takes her to Mumbai, India, to the red light district where the brothels are. He puts her in a room and he says, honey, stay here. I'll be back in a few minutes. As she was coming in, she saw all these women and girls milling around with funny dresses. And she said, no, 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 don't leave me. I'm scared. He says, it's OK. I'll be right back. He then goes to the madam to get the $500 for having just sold her to the brothel. He has the gold from the wedding and he hands the wedding pictures over to her as well. He then leaves to go back to Nepal to do this again and again, maybe 40 or 50 times in a year. The madam then goes into the room where the girl is and says, guess what? Your husband just sold you to me and you're gonna be with 20 guys uh, today, a uh, gay every day because I say so. You can imagine her shock. No, 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 my husband loves me. Oh, that's what happens. When she kind of internalizes what's going on, many of these girls say, I will kill myself before I do those shameful things. The madam then brings out the photograph of the wedding and says, it's your mom, your dad, your brother. If you hurt yourself, we'll hurt them. So she's trapped in a situation. In order to make her into a prostitute, it's quite simple. You simply shame her. So they bring in a couple of professional rapists. And then over a two or three day period of time, they'll take this 12 year old girl and rape her 20, 30, 40 times until eventually she just lays back and accepts whatever happens to her. After that, she's put on the line, which means that she will be with 20 guys a day, every day, until after a couple of years, she gets what's called black eye, where she's so depleted physically and emotionally and spiritually that nobody wants her, so they throw her out onto the street. Some of them made it back to Nepal and I was able to see them. Many of them languished in India and just died of AIDS. So I was hearing this story over and over again, but I didn't understand the evil of it until I actually went to those brothels. I was invited by the Indian government to do public health checks. I had a police officer with me, went into one of the brothels and there was an 11 year old trafficking victim. This girl saw this Caucasian guy, saw an opportunity, literally um, ran up to me and wrapped herself around me and said, save me, save me, they're doing terrible things to me. I looked down at this child who was hysterically crying. I turned to the police officer and said, we need to get her out of here. He said, we can't do that. I said, what are you talking about? You're a police officer, you're a cop. He says, if we try to leave, we'll both be killed. To make a long story short, we left, we came back with more police, but of course this girl was gone. Now I tell this story because I wasn't one of those 15 year olds that said, when I grow up, I wanna become an activist. In fact, I did everything I could not to be an activist. But every once in a while in life, we have this big test. This was my big test. I failed miserably after that I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. And I did what a lot of activists eventually do. I surrendered to the fact that now that I've been exposed to this, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. And 30 years later, here I am talking to you. But it's not just women and girls, it's men and boys. Top right-hand photo is a picture of a fishing boat in Thailand. Story behind this is a 15-year-old boy is told that um, 
he has to go to Thailand to get a job to support his family. They're poor. He goes down to Thailand. He's looking for work, looking for work, not finding it. Eventually, a trafficker sees this, goes up to him and says, hey, brother, you're from Cambodia. I'm from Cambodia. Let me help you out. Let me lend you some money. Okay, well, now that you have my money, you have to stay with me. But guess what? I got this great job for you. I'm going to take you down to the ocean and put you on a boat. The boat will go out for you know a couple of months. It'll come back. Uh, you'll catch a bunch of fish. You guys love catching fish, right? After that, they'll pay you a lot of money. You'll go home. You'll be a big hero. So they go down to the boat. He doesn't realize he's been sold onto the boat. The boat goes out, but it doesn't come back after three months. It stays out for four years. This poor kid will end up working 17, 18, 19 hours a day, every day. If he doesn't, he gets beaten, he gets tortured. The only food he gets the entire time he's there is rice and fish, nothing nutritious. You can imagine what that does to your body after four years. In order to get him to work, they give strong stimulants. So he's constantly on these drugs. If he gets injured, if he gets sick, they throw him off the side of the boat. At the end of the four years, Guy is brought into port. He goes to the captain and says, give me something. Captain says, go away. You're illegally in my country. Guy says, I'm going to tell the police what you did to me. Captain says, go ahead. We own the police. This is another example of human trafficking. Bottom center photo is I lived and worked in Thailand. I worked for the United Nations for six years. And we were often associated with raids and rescues. Story behind this is a person from Myanmar, also known as Burma, because of the conflict, comes into Thailand and is looking for work. Here's that there's work in a place called Sumit Sakan. There's 4,500 seafood packing companies there. Goes down there, knocks on the door of one of the factories. Factory owner comes out and says, what do you need? I'm looking for a job. Factory owner says, OK, I'll give you a job. I'll pay you the equivalent of 50 US dollars a month, but you have to stay in the factory. You can't leave. This guy's never made more than $25 a month. He's thrilled. He immediately accepts the job, goes into the factory, works under these horrific conditions. But at least in the back of his mind, he's thinking, well, I can send this money home to my family. After a couple of months, he goes to the manager and says, I'd like to be paid. Manager says, well, you know, I forgot to mention one thing. For you to live here with room and board and food and everything else, it costs 54 US dollars. I'm only paying you $50, which isn't enough to co even cover that. So guess what? You owe me money and you can't leave until you pay that back. So every one of these people in this factory were languishing in a situation where every day they worked, they got deeper and deeper in debt. The way it was set up, there's no way of getting out of that debt. And so some of these people had worked there three, four, five years, uh, seven days a week, no hopes, no dreams, no aspirations. Once a month, they would take one of these people to the back at a factory, beat them until they were bloody, take photographs of it, and then go and show everybody to say, if you try to leave, this will happen not only to you, but to your family as well. This is another form of human trafficking. What all of these things have in common is a person loses control of their life. They're forced to work. They use debts or threats to hold them in place. And this is what we call modern slavery. But there's a new form of modern slavery that just we were just introduced to about six months ago. This is happening in Southeast Asia. We're kind of educated people from Taiwan and Hong Kong and China and Vietnam and Australia, New Zealand and United States are tricked and deceived into coming to Cambodia. And when they get there, they're put in a van and driven to a compound, which is basically a scam compound. It's a multi-story building, maybe 10 stories high with hundreds of these victims that are locked in place, locked in the facility and forced to scam their fellow um, countrymen, 14, 15, 16 hours a day, every day. If they don't, they get beaten, they get tortured, they get tasered. Um, in some cases, they'll sell these individuals back to family members for 20, 30, 40,000 US dollars. And so this is the type of trafficking that we had never seen before. Usually you tra get trafficked into a forced labor type situation. But in this particular case, the work is to scam other people out of their money. So to add insult to injury, a lot of these people say, well, I would rather dig ditches than to cheat the people from my country. It's a very violent situation and it's an emerging trend we're seeing. Other things that we see is that I often do presentations to businesses that say, well, this has nothing to do with us. Not too long ago, I presented to a pharmaceutical company. And at the end they said, well, we're a pharmaceutical company. We don't have an issue of human trafficking. 
So I asked them how they got their drugs from their warehouse in order to the individual stores. And they basically said, well, we don't know. So they looked into it and they came to realize that the third party contractors that they were using had exploitative situations which would have been identified as modern slavery. So even a company like that faces a situation. Similar case in uh, um, Singapore presented at a law firm. They said, we're a law firm. We don't have any supply chains or anything. We don't have to be concerned about this. Who cleans your building? We, we've never really looked into it. Look into it. They looked into it and they came to realize that there was an exploitative situation related to that. So the point is, is that if you shine a light on almost any kind of business, you can eventually find that there may be this type of exploitation. Now, when it comes to human trafficking um, and modern slavery, these terms are often used interchangeably, but they mean different things. So let me explain the difference between them. So 30 years ago, when we were trying to identify what to call this thing that we were seeing with these girls being sent off to different countries. We didn't have a name at that time. The ultimate name that they came up with was human trafficking because trafficking equates movement of something to eventually be sold. So like drug trafficking, you take drugs from one country to another and you sell them, or you take arms and you take them from one place to another and sell them. In this particular case, it was human beings. So the movement in order to be exploited was considered to be relevant. But then over time, people said, well, wait a minute. Some of these cases have a person going from one country to another, or from one province within a country to another province, or from one side of a city to another. What difference does it make how a person got there? Shouldn't we focus on the exploitation? So when they look for terms that basically kind of identify the type of exploitation uh, that we're talking about, where a person doesn't get paid and they can't leave and they're held in place and all these other things, the word slavery kept coming up. But because most people think of slavery as being something that happened a long time ago, they put the word modern next to it. So human trafficking is the process by which a person gets moved into the end point, which is modern slavery. Now, in the United States, they don't use modern slavery as terminology because there's no legal definition for this, but much of the rest of the world does. When it comes to the number of people who are in modern slavery, up until a week ago, it was 40 million. In fact, there, it was estimated there were more slaves today than any other time in history. Where I live and work in Asia, 62% of the people who are in modern slavery are in my backyard in Hong Kong, in, in that area. Why? Because there's a lot of Asians. China, 1.4 billion people. India, 1.27 billion people. Then you have Pakistan and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. And all these countries have pretty large population sizes. In addition to that, the feudal systems that have existed in these locations for many, many years have never been completely dismantled. So you go to Beijing, very modern city, go 20 kilometers in any direction outside of that city, and you're going to find exploitative situations out there in the world that basically um, you know, demonstrate the, uh, the fact that modern slavery is still alive and well. When it comes to uh, kind of the statistics, according to the slavery index, there's 17,000 Canadian people in Canada that are modern slaves. This includes victims of prostitution, agriculture, domestic work, et cetera, et cetera. I think the number is underestimated. I think it's much higher than that. In the United States, it's estimated somewhere between 400,000 and 700,000. So you're talking about a lot of people in a situation related to modern slavery. Post-COVID, we anticipate that the numbers are going to go way up. In fact, as I mentioned, a week ago, the number was 40 million. Three days ago, there was a report that came out that estimated that the number is now 50 million. So at a given time, there's 50 million people in modern slavery around the world. Why did COVID affect this? Well, because of desperation. You have a situation where a person has... Um, uh, worked in a garment factory. She was quite happy with her job. She was supporting five, six other people. All of a sudden, COVID hits. The factory closes down. She's sent home. She basically has no incoming con coming in. She uh, uses her savings up pretty quickly. And before you know it, she's borrowing money. Eventually, she borrows enough money that the money lender comes back and says, you got to pay this back. She has no income coming in. How is she going to pay it back? So the a money lender will say, well, I need a family member to go on a fishing boat, or I need a family member to go and work in a sweatshop or something else. And so these people are basically taken away. So we anticipate a significant increase, and we're already beginning to see this. The rate of exploitation of the number of people who enter at different timeframes, 
about 9.2 million people enter per year, about 25,200 per day. In the time it takes me to do this presentation, about 1,000 people will new slave every four seconds. So if we count to four, one, two, three, four, somewhere in the world, a person is entering into modern slavery and the drum beats on and on and on. You can see what it is that we're up against. When it comes to the age distribution, about a quarter of the cases are children, the rest are adults. Most people think that human trafficking, modern slavery is predominantly sex trafficking, but in reality, it's only about a quarter of those cases. The rest of the cases are forced labor cases. And this is where it comes back to us as human beings. 60% of the forced labor cases are associated with supply chains, where we get our electronics and our clothes and our shoes and our fish and everything else. So as consumers, we buy things. And a certain percentage of what we buy is tainted by modern slavery. We don't know when we're buying things that would be uh, tainted by modern slavery, but statistically speaking, we on a regular basis would be doing so. Now, the reason why this is relevant is because it then ties the problem to us as consumers. Like in the global warming um, kind of world, for a long time, nobody took any responsibility for the fact that we were contributing to modern uh, to global warming. And then uh, uh, the Inconvenient Truth film came out, and a lot of publicity came out that said as human beings, we use energy. We use our cars, we use lights, we use other things. So as a result of that, we are contributing to global uh, warming, and so we have to be part of the solution. If we're buying things that are tainted by modern slavery, you have to make the same argument that we as human beings have to be part of the solution. I'll come back to that point in, in a few minutes. Okay, so who needs to be addressing this issue? Well, because it's an illegal activity, it should be governments. But if uh, governments really hate this topic, whether you're the government of Hong Kong or Thailand or Vietnam or Singapore, many of these countries are embarrassed that they have slaves in their country. It's a very complicated situation to get rid of them and to address them. So things are done, but you're not usually enough to really make significant difference. I worked for the United Nations for six years. I'll put my hand on my heart when I say this. I believe in the United Nations system, but I spent a lot of time in five-star hotels eating really good food, talking about poverty and human trafficking. There was a real disconnect between what we were doing and where we needed to be, which is in the front lines. So the groups that are doing most of the work related to addressing this issue is the NGO world. And they're the ones that do the raids and the rescues and the prevention work and the legal work, and they help the victims afterwards and so on and so on. So this is where much of the action is done. But again, if we go back to the statistics, out of 40 million people, 75% in forced labor and 60% associated with supply chains, there's another group that needs to be involved, the private sector. But if you think governments hate this topic, the private sector loathes it. And the reason for that is because they're often on the receiving end of somebody wagging a finger and saying, you guys are so greedy that you would willingly use slaves for shareholder profits. Now, in reality, big branded companies would never do that. Exploitation is a huge reputational risk for them. But most consumers believe that to be the case. And I know this because I get in front of a lot of audiences and that's what I hear. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the report card for the number of people who were helped out of modern slavery last year. 40 million, we use that number, 40 million people. This is with all the government, NGO, and um, United Nations people combined working together. Then I'm going to show you out of a half million greed incentivized criminals, how many of them were put in jail. So in your mind, think about what a good number would be, and here are the results. Last year, the world helped 108,000 uh, 108, people out of modern slavery, out of 40 million. If you do the math, it's 0.2% of the victims, not even a percentage point. Out of a half million criminals, about 9,000 of them, usually low-level people went to jail, 0.8%. Now, when you look at this, you might ask the question, does the counter-trafficking world not care? Are we lazy? We're not doing our job? That's not the issue. Anyone who works on this topic desperately wants to do something to help address the issue of modern slavery. The issue is this. The profits generated from modern slavery are estimated to be 150 billion US dollars a year, second only to drug trafficking, which is $300 billion, second largest trans transnational crime. The amount of money available to address this is about 
$350 million or 0.23% of the profits. So the profits are this big and the amount of money available to fight it is tiny and insignificant. To put this into perspective, in the United States, we eat a lot of potato chips, $6 billion worth of potato chips a year. It takes 21 days of potato chip eating to come up with the equivalent amount of money that's available to address modern slavery. You can see what it is that we're up against. Another thing is the number of people who do, does this work full time like me is about 20,000 people against the half million greed incentivized criminals. We have to follow rules and regulations and rule of law. We have to get approvals from our donors. Everything has to be done strategically. If you're a criminal, you just mutate or change or evolve or kill somebody. And basically you can get away from uh, whatever it is that somebody's coming after you. So there's a real unfair advantage in terms of the size of the population of criminals versus the responders and what they're able to do to, to to um, basically stay ahead of the game. And lastly, awareness. Uh, usually when I'm in front of a group of people and I can see them, I would ask the question, how many of you in this group knew 20% of what I was talking about today before I said it? And often I don't get any hands at all or maybe one or two hands because most people don't know about this particular topic. Now, the problem with that is that if you don't know about a topic, you're not gonna care. If you don't care, you're not gonna do anything to address it. So helping to raise awareness is an extremely important part of this overall process. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna switch over to the private sector and ask the basic question, how is it the business world all of a sudden found them their way into this? 15 years ago, the banks and the manufacturers and the hospitality sector had nothing to do with human trafficking. How did it all of a sudden become an issue that's on their plate? And a lot of this came down to that number of 0.2%. When the regulators and the governments came to realize that the collective actions of the NGOs, the United Nations and the governments wasn't even 1%, and they knew that supply chains were involved, they said, okay, well, we need to bring the private sector into this. And so a number of things were put in place, usually business risks or things that motivated businesses through something potential, potentially negative, were introduced, and I'll go through them very quickly. The first one is expanding legislation. And so prior to 2021, um, I mean 2012, you had a situation where the businesses and the United Nations and the governments would periodically come together to talk about human rights and human trafficking and so forth. The outcome of these meetings often resulted in the suggestion that a paper get written or a convention be developed and so forth. And so these things happened and they are available, but they're not binding, they're voluntary. So there's these great documents that talk about how the businesses can address modern slavery and various other things, but nobody has to use them. The first real legislation related to this came about in 2012. It was called the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. What this act basically said is that if you're a big company, and you have profits of $100 million in retail or manufacturing, and you have a single product in California, you have to put on your website what you're doing to address modern slavery. If you're not doing anything at all, and you say that, you're in compliance, but you have to say something. After that, a couple of years later, the UK Modern Slavery Act was put in place. That act took the $100 million ceiling and dropped it to 36 million sterling pounds, but it added two additional things. Number one, an annual report. Number two, that annual report had to be signed by the board of directors. And then the French Act came and the Australian Act and the German Act comes out in another six months. Canada's talking about having an app and so forth. What we're seeing is that with each of these kind of acts in different countries, they add more bells and whistles. So initially it was just website posting and it was annual reports. What we're seeing with the German Act is that there will be fines and penalties. If you're a big manufacturing company and you get uh, found to have modern slavery, you're gonna be fined. They're gonna ask you to pay up money. Now the banks have been doing that for a long time, but this has never happened in manufacturing. The Canadian law is supposed to have the same type of language so that if you're a Canadian company and you're found to have modern slavery associated with your company, you're gonna be fined and penalized. That's a new thing. You haven't seen that before. Another thing that we're seeing is class action lawsuits against big companies. So let's say that you're a big retailer and you go to Thailand and you buy a lot of shellfish and prawns and various other things. 
What the plaintiffs are saying is that by you buying those products, you're contributing to modern slavery. You have to use your influence in order to, to stop this from happening. And so since a lot of these kind of uh, retailers don't have much influence in supply chains related to fishing industry, there's nothing that they can really do. In fact, in one case, the plaintiffs wanted there to be on the label of the tuna fish a warning that said this product could be tainted by modern slavery. Imagine if you went into your supermarket and picked up a can of tuna fish and you saw that written on there. You're not going to buy that product. And so this has the potential to have reputational risk for these companies. Chocolate industry often gets sued because the cocoa beans come from places in Africa that are not very accessible. And, but at the same time, there's a lot of exploitation associated with that. So these lawsuits can really embarrass a company and they can result in the company not getting the revenues that they would have gotten ordinarily because people don't want to buy companies that are in that situation. We're seeing media coverage related to this double almost every year for the past five years. Now, those of you who are a little bit older know that in the 1990s, the predominant press coverage in a development issue was HIV AIDS. For 10 years, we saw articles and exposés on a regular basis coming out. When was the last time you saw an article on HIV AIDS? Not for a long time. But the problem is just as bad as it was back in the 1990s. What happens is certain topics get a lot of prominence for a while, and then it's replaced with another topic. So after HIV AIDS, it was the environmental movement. So 15 years, we saw that. The new development issue of our time is human slavery. The more information you put out there, the more appetite people have for even additional information. And as a result of that, you have a situation where more and more uh, data and stories and exposés and testimonials will come out related to this particular topic. Then there's ESG. For those of you who don't use ESG, ESG refers to E as environmental, S is social, G is governance. It represents a series of indicators that big companies will track to demonstrate that they're doing right by the environment, by their employees, by their communities, and so forth. So up until now, they have voluntarily filled out these indicators. And the reason why they do that is because big investment companies are looking for sustainable companies, companies that are doing right by the world, companies that have purpose and so forth. And so those companies that are reporting on ESG are getting a higher uh, investment ratio. But post-COVID, this has changed. It used to be voluntary, but what we're anticipating to have having happen is that more and more consumers will also want to see what these scores are. And so you will see the S and ESG focuses on kind of modern slavery, human trafficking, various other things. You're going to see that there will eventually be a list of indicators every company will have to fill them out, and this will allow consumers to determine whether or not companies are doing right by the world or not. And the reason why this is important is because people care. According to one major study, 84% of millennials cared about what companies did, whether it was the environment or their employees or communities or anything else. And so as people come to care about these things, companies have to take this much more seriously. In addition to this, these same individuals will eventually be the fund managers of these huge funds. And if they care about it now, now they're going to care about it then as well. And so this is another reason why we're seeing uh, that change. Just to give you a sense of what happens if a newspaper article kind of goes out that embarrasses a company can have a devastating impact on their business, up to a loss of an average of $69 million for every kind of uh, scandal that comes out related to a particular company that had a factory that was identified to have modern slavery and so forth. So this is a real problem for manufacturers and they have to be really concerned about this. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about manufacturers to just put this into perspective. And I'm going to start off by looking at like a manufacturer of, let's say, a running shoe. So if you are a, a manufacturer of a running shoe, you would have a supply chain that would have different tiers. There's traditionally around three tiers. Tier one is where the actual shoe is assembled, where all the component parts are there and you just put it together. Tier two is where the rivets are and the shoelaces and the zippers and the, the, the sole of the shoe and the, the textiles. Tier three is where the raw material is. 
This is where the metal comes from, the cotton, the wool, the rubber, various other things. So most companies that are major companies have been auditing tier one for about 30 years, but none of them have looked at tier two or three because it was never asked of them. But with this new emerging legislation, it says you have to understand your entire supply chain from top to bottom. So this poses a problem for big companies. Let's say that you're a big shoe wear company and you were auditing 2000 tier one factories a year. All of a sudden you have to do tier two and three. That means you might have to do 10,000 audits. Who's gonna pay for that? Is that cost gonna be kind of charged on the shoe? It's a real problem. And so what we're beginning to see is that companies are coming together and saying, okay, we're both using the same zipper company rather than us both auditing it. You do zippers, we'll do rivets, somebody else does shoelaces. And so this rationalization process is taking place to allow for there to be more efficiency. And we'll see more and more of that over time. But what auditors are looking for are certain indicators of exploitation. Abuse of vulnerability, deception, restriction of movement, isolation, physical and sexual violence, et cetera, et cetera. These are the types of things that they look at. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about uh, a couple of these. Uh, so I'm going to use Nepal and Malaysia as an example. So in Nepal, you have this guy. He lives and works in a village. He makes the equivalent of around 50 U.S. dollars a month. A, a recruitment agency for international migration comes up and says, how would you like to make 250 U.S. dollars a month? Well, that sounds great. What do I have to do? Well, you have to sign this agreement. You have to come with me to the capital. You have to get training. We'll get you a passport, tickets. We'll send you to Malaysia and make a bunch of money. Oh, by the way, you also have to give us 1,500 U.S. dollars. Guy says, I'm poor. I don't have $1,500. Don't worry about it. Sign this agreement. We'll get you the money. You can pay it back very, very quickly. What this guy doesn't understand is how interest compounds very quickly and there's extra fees and everything else. And by the time he gets to Kathmandu, $1,500 is $3,000. And that keeps uh, growing. And so by the time he gets to Malaysia to work, he's working literally for two, three, four years just to pay back the interest and the capital on this loan that he took. And that's called debt bondage. And the reason why it's an indicator of modern slavery is because the factory can hold him in place by saying, you can't leave because you owe money. And so because you owe money, until you pay that money back, you're there. You're there. So that's why it's an indicator of modern slavery. A second thing is, let's say the person is in Nepal and somebody reads him the contract or he reads the contract himself and he signs it because he knows what it says. But when he gets off the plane in Malaysia, they give him another contract, but it's in a foreign language. He doesn't know what it says. Guy says, I can't sign it. I don't know what I'm signing. They say, you better sign it or we're going to send you back. You're going to lose everything. Don't worry. It doesn't say anything bad. He signs it, but in that document, it basically cheated him. They add room and board and fees and penalties and everything else into that document. So he's not really making 250, maybe it's $120. And again, all that money is going to paying for the debt he has. The third thing would be an example of when he arrives there, they immediately take his passport. They say they're using it for you know, work permits and so forth, but they hold on to it. So let's say that he works for a year and he really doesn't like the work and he wants to go home. He says, please give me my passport, I'm leaving. They say, well, we're not gonna give it back. You agreed to be here for three years. Well, I'll go to the police then and tell them, go ahead. A migrant in our country goes to the police, doesn't have his documents, you're going to go to jail. You'll end up spending six months or a year there. They'll send you back. You have had all this debt. Your life is going to be a lot worse. You better just stay here and work. So you can see how they use that to leverage a person holding them in place. And so what they're doing is basically training everybody from the C-suite all the way down to uh, the lowest level of a brand but also uh, training the factories and the sub factories and the sub sub factories, but in the local languages so that employees know what their rights are so that they understand that like this should not happen to them if they're in this factory situation. Another thing that we're seeing is a zero tolerance for debt. So let's say you again, you're that running shoe. If you want to go to a factory, you go to that factory and say, is there anyone in that factory who has indebtedness? If they do, we won't work with you. Or if you want to work with us, you have to pay that debt. 
before we basically work with you. So this policy of responsible recruitment is basically uh, put in place to, be, to demonstrate that uh, the, the, the big companies have nothing to do with any kind of indebtedness. Another thing would be apps that are developed. These apps uh, allow for grievance mechanisms to be reported anonymously to like NGOs that track this type of information. And as a result of that, then they can determine whether there's a problem in the factory. The point I'm making is that a lot of manufacturers are really stepping up their game, changing things and getting much more involved in ensuring that there's no exploitation in their business. So let's now switch over to the banks. Why would the banks care about something like this? Well, basically it comes down to this number again. $150 billion generated from modern slavery. If any of that money gets into a legitimate bank, it's money laundering. And who basically is um, fined and penalized? The bank does. There was one bank in Australia that was fined 1.3 billion Australian dollars because they allowed online sexual exploitation of children to take place um, through transactions associated with the banks. And as a result of that, the regulators find them this amount of money. That's a tremendous amount of money. When it comes to why banks have to be concerned about this, the fines and the penalties that I mentioned, reputational risk, if your name is associated with human trafficking, that has a devastating impact on your business. Obviously, this is going to hurt you. Naming and shaming could take place. And so, you know, uh, that particular bank that I was talking about, they had a number of their senior staff resigned as a result of this. The bank's name was tarnished, you know, for it took them 100 years to get that reputation. And then in one sweep, it's all gone. So this is a big deal. And a lot of banks are kind of stepping up and doing things in order to address these problems. So there's four kind of areas that we're seeing in, in Asia that are uh, what uh, companies do. The first is to develop typologies. A typology is when you take the victim and the perpetrator and you look at the relationship they have over time and space to determine the various actions that take place along that journey from a person not being a trafficking victim to being a trafficking victim and again getting into that world. At the same time, they look at possible transactions that could happen at each step of the way to see if those transactions could be anything associated with human trafficking. A second thing that's being done is a forensic accounting, and it's exactly what it, as it sounds, where you use accounting to determine whether there may be nefarious bad things that are taking place that you want to kind of regulate and check that could be associated with modern slavery. Another thing would be looking at big data, the data that a bank has in terms of its transactions, analyzing it, studying it, determine whether or not there are patterns that could be associated with human trafficking. We're seeing that non-government organizations, charitable groups like mine, are actually working closely to the, with the banks. In the past, that would be something that wouldn't happen because basically the banks and the NGOs look at the world much differently. And a lot of NGOs often name and shame banks. They wag their finger at the banks and say, you guys are bad. And so there isn't trust there. But there are organizations like mine that actually they have trust because we've developed that over time. We're seeing relationships between law enforcement and banks for the first time. Now, there are all kinds of privacy issues that prevent banks from getting into specifics of clients, but they can talk about things in an anonymized way. And so the banks can teach law enforcement what types of transactions should they try or, or, leak or uh, financial uh, relationships that um, the uh, criminals have, what kind of patterns do you find when you interview them? And then the law enforcement can basically sensitize the banks to how this is how human trafficking takes place. And then world check and world compliance are negative news inventories. What they do is they have millions of cases of publicly available information that is documented. So the person walks into a bank and wants to get a bank account, their name will be compared to this database. And if it comes up, they're not going to get a bank account. Same with the business. So I'll go into these in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is a typology. This would be for sex trafficking. You can see that there are certain steps along the way with cars and buses and various other things. And then down below, you see the uh, transactions. Um, and a certain number of these transactions have red flags next to them, which means that there's something about that transaction that if you put it with other transactions, could be perceived as being 
a problem for for the particular um, transit the, the the situation that you're dealing with here. So these typologies are used basically to help law enforcement, help banks, help organizations that are interested in protecting their business to protect their business. These are two reports that we did related to typologies. In here, you'd see uh, probably a couple dozen typologies, but also the transactions that are red flags as well. Once you have that information, then you use forensic accounting. So as an example, in the East Coast of the United States, there was a Vietnamese nail salon. In this particular salon had hours from nine o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. But an accountant found that there are transactions taking place at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, all around $200. When they looked into it, they found that there was a sex trafficking ring being run in the same business. So the kind of red flag indicators that were used in this particular case were transactions after hours around $200 with a certain type of business. If you take that information and run it against big uh, data, you might be able to find similar patterns. Another thing that uh, these typologies do is identify not only transactions, but even within a bank, you know, you could you can see things. So, for example, I did some training in Bangladesh, and what we saw there was that the bankers would see that a recruitment person would come in with 10, 15 different people, take all their documentation, go over to the desk, and try to register everybody in. He wouldn't let any of the bank people talk to the to the migrants that were there. He put the bank accounts both in their name, but also in his name so that he could demonstrate that a transaction took place, but then he could take the money back immediately afterwards. Um, you know, so there were a lot of red flags associated with that. In Thailand, just by virtue of the business being a massage parlor or a bar or a beauty salon, these are all suspicious type businesses. And in some cases, you'd see a person who runs a kiosk that drives a Mercedes Benz and has a big house because basically that's a front for the, the real work that they do, which is to basically exploit people and sex trafficking and various other things. So once again, you take these packages of red flags, you apply it to big data, and then you can find certain patterns. Once again, the NGOs uh, are uh, very important to the banks because we understand how human trafficking takes place. Who are the perpetrators? How do they do it? What do they say? Where do they get people from? What do they get trafficked into? How do they move people from different locations? And so by providing that data, the banks and the financial institutions can basically plan and uh, these typologies and set up more so that they can figure out what these patterns are. We're also seeing more emphasis with law enforcement. Now, bankers look at the world uh, in a particular way and so does law enforcement, but they often kind of look at the world very differently. And so organizations like mine act as a bridge. So the banks would give to the um, law enforcement information on what types of financial indicators they should be collecting. And then the, um, the law enforcement people can give typology information over to the bank. So it becomes a symbiotic relationship that is very uh, supported on both sides. As I mentioned, the uh, World Check and World Compliance are these huge databases. They have literally millions and millions of listings of publicly available um, articles about criminal behavior that made it into the newspaper. Once it's in the newspaper, it's in the public domain. And so they collect this information and they analyze this to client information to see if it, people have a, a, an issue or problem with uh, being on this list. Now, 10 years ago, there was nothing related to human trafficking on this, but a number of organizations like mine came together and we scour the newspapers and the uh, radio shows and the television shows to find this uh, information. And then we give it to LexisNexis and to Reuters and various other organizations so that they can put it in this database. And this to demonstrate the extent to which this information is out there, this is kind of a, a heat map that demonstrates where you will find um, criminal beha and behavior activity that would be in these databases. It's all over the, the, the map here. Now, the organization that I run is called the Mekong Club. We work with the private sector in a positive, supportive, non-naming and shaming way. We do that because we believe that the private sector wants to do the right thing, or at least the big responsible companies. We call ourselves the Mekong Club because the name doesn't mean anything. 
when we were setting up this organization, we had major companies say, if you call it human trafficking or human rights or anything like that, we won't go to you because people will ask the question, are you working with that organization because you have a problem? So for us, the Mekong River goes through Southeast Asia. That's where most of our work is. And at the same time, club just didn't really mean anything. So we called it the Mekong Club and, and the rest is history. Um, we have an association, which includes about 60 of some of the largest companies in the world. They come from the banking sector, the manufacturing sector, retail, hospitality. Um, just for as an aside, the hospitality industry has to be concerned about this issue because of four things. Number one, they have construction, which should be fraught by modern slavery. Number two, they have third-party contractors that they bring in for cleaning rooms and doing dishes and security. They have supply chains that could be tainted for seafood and linen and uh, furniture and various other things. And lastly, sex trafficking. There are uh, motels and hotels in the United States that often get sued. And the reason why they get sued is because there was a sex trafficking victim that was used there for a period of time, and these cases are being lost. And this creates a fundamental problem for the hospitality sector because the insurance companies are questioning whether they should insure these organizations anymore because it's, and that would be a real problem if the hospitality sector couldn't get this kind of insurance. First thing we do with our partners is we uh, assess where they are in their journey in addressing modern slavery. The banks usually, out of a score of 500, get about half. The manufacturers, maybe three quarters. And the reason for that is that a lot of these organizations don't realize that you have to have your leadership knowing about this issue, your board. You have to have policies and procedures in place. You have to have you know, um, training. You have to have risk assessments. You have to have focal people. You have to have auditing. You have to have remediation programs. So addressing this issue isn't just simply putting in place audits and checking to see whether or not your partners are in trouble. There's so many other things that have to be done. We also developed e-learning toolkits because when our community meets, which is about every quarter, we debate, discuss, and identify what needs to be done in order to address modern slavery. And as a result of this, they make suggestions on tools that should be developed. One tool is this e-learning. It's uh, 15, three and a half minute films that addresses every aspect of human trafficking, but it's available in multiple languages. So it's not just in English. 97% of what is out there is in English, but a lot of the people who need it speak other languages. So having this type of a toolkit is very relevant and important. As another example, we have an app and I don't have it on a phone in my hand, but if I did, the way the app works is that an auditor would go up to migrants within a factory and get them to press the flag from where they come from. So with headphones on that person in their language after they press the flag, it would say, we're gonna ask you some questions. If the answer to the question is yes, press green, no press red. Some of the questions would be like, are you being exploited? Do you have indebtedness? Do you have freedom of movement, et cetera, et cetera. If they answer these questions uh, even once with the green, you know there's a kind of an issue associated with this and then they can address these kind of issues. So it's a, it's a, it's a way of uh, helping to protect the company. You have uh, remediation toolkits. This is another one where if a person gets a call from BBC and they say, and BBC says, well, we found one of your factories has forced labor. We're going to do an article. Do you have um, a statement that you want to make? Basically, what the, the remediation toolkit allows you to do, whether you're a lawyer or a comms person, a social networking or a risk assessment, is to follow the various steps that are needed. And when you press any of these boxes, what you get is basically the information you need to in order to uh, to help address that remediation problem. So what I'm going to do now is to switch over to another topic for a few minutes. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the private sector. I'm talking about human beings who have just heard this presentation. So after hearing this, um, many of you have information that you didn't have in the past. And so I'm going to start off with a particular story. And so here's the story. So 30 years ago, when I was living in Nepal, I desperately wanted to do something to help address the issue of human trafficking, as I mentioned. And so I decided I was going to write a book. As part of this book process, I would go from shelter to shelter to interview the women and the girls, went into one shelter, and there was a girl named Gita. And every time I approached her, she said, no, 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 I don't want to talk to you. But she sat and listened to all the interviews that I was doing. 
When I finished and I was leaving, Gita comes running up and says, I changed my mind. You can have my story. So Gita sat on one side of the table, the rest of us on the other side of the table. In over a three hour period, she just told the worst story that I have ever heard of rape and torture and disease and betrayal and murder. I honestly didn't know what to say to this young girl. I was just blown away. It was just such a bad story. Finally, I turned to her and I said, wow, Gita, you must be so angry at the traffickers for the horrific things they did to you. She paused and paused. And then she said, no, I'm angry at you and you and you. She pointed at us. She said, where were you? She said that every single day she prayed for somebody to come in and help her. Nobody came. She said that she went to school till she was 12. She knew that all those people out there that were doing these illegal things were right out in the open. Nobody was doing anything. She said she wasn't angry at the traffickers. She said they're just bad people being bad people. Said she was angry at the good people in society for allowing a 15-year-old girl to be commercially raped 7,000 times only to eventually get AIDS and she was dying. Now, I told this story because Gita pretty much called us all out. She understood that the 20,000 people like me was insufficient to really make a dent in addressing modern slavery. She realized that the world needs to care for this to go away. So I often say to my audiences, if I could get each of you to do at least one thing a year related to human trafficking, if there are 100 people, that's 100 things, or 1,000 people, that's 1,000 people. If we can get 10 million people to do one thing, that's 10 million compassionate acts and gestures that are going to add up. And so people often say, well, what is it that I can do? Well, one thing you can do is learn about this issue. Well, guess what? You just listened to this. You've done your one thing. How easy was that? But if you go tell two or three other people, you've done another thing and another thing. If you post an article on LinkedIn, you've done another thing. All of these things pretty much add up. You can report if you see something. Here, I'm doing a 53-day uh, kind of presentation tour across Canada and the United States. I'm on a day 17. I've had six people come up to me and say, you know, I was at that airport. Or that, I was at that bus station. I saw something. It didn't seem right, but I didn't do anything about it. I wish I had. If you see something reported, there are hotlines related to this or 911, whatever it is that you have in your jurisdiction. You can be a responsible consumer before you go online, determine whether or not uh, a company has a policy. You can just go and, and look at their website. If they do, congratulate them. If they don't, say to them, listen, I like your product, but I would feel better if you had this on your website. It can be done in a very respectful way. You can volunteer. My youngest volunteer was nine years old. This girl saw me in a uh, documentary. She approached me and said, I saw you in this documentary. It's terrible what human trafficking is. What can I do to help? I said, you're nine years old. She said, so what? I said, you're nine years old. She said, nine-year-olds are the new 16-year-olds. Give me a chance. So I said, what can you do? She said she could find anything on the internet. So I gave her a task that I had given to two of my Yale second year law students that they couldn't find it. And within two days, she did. She came back and said, what else do you need me to do? Because that was her God-given gift. That's what she was good at. She knew how to basically find things. So whether you're a public speaker or you know a poet or you do dance or, or sell t-shirts, I don't care. Use your, your God-given gift, You know the thing that you feel like you're good at, apply it to volunteerism that really makes a difference. About 70% of our volunteers are professionals like you who want to give something back. And so we just work with them because everyone has skills to offer. You can donate or fundraise. A lot of the organizations like mine, post-COVID, you know, our funding has significantly dropped at a time when human trafficking is going up. And as a result of that, you know, all of these things, if done in large numbers, would really add it up. So I'm just going to tell one more story. And this story is about uh, an experience that I had a couple of years ago when I was at the American Banking Association Conference. At the end of the conference, uh, as I was getting off of stage, I just finished the presentation, this guy comes up and says, I want to tell you a story. That happens as a public speaker. And so he said, I was taking my wife and teenage daughter from one part of the United States to the other. When we got to the halfway point uh, on our drive there, we pulled into a motel. I got my wife and uh, daughter settled. And then I was leaving. I saw this 14-year-old girl being dragged into a room. I thought it had something to do with prostitution. It was very violent. I have a teenage daughter, I felt really bad about it. So I went to the desk to report it. After that, I went back to my room, not knowing if anything would happen. But sure enough, you know, a police car came, you know, 15 minutes later. 
15 minutes later, that guy's being taken out in handcuffs. The girl's being taken off to a car. She's driven away, presumably to a shelter. I wanted to tell you this because I felt so proud of myself. It's a milestone in my life. So I looked at this guy and I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a compliance officer. I said, well, do you ever run human trafficking cases? And yeah, we do this. We get the information. We think it's suspicious. We do a suspicious transaction report. We give it to the regulators. And I said to him, dude, don't you realize you've been doing this work all along? Maybe it's not as in your face as it was in that particular case, but the outcome of what you do might result in police doing exactly what happened there. You're heroic. You're a hero. Do you understand that? This was like an epiphany for him. He couldn't understand uh, or he hadn't understood up until that point. He said, yeah, you're right. What we do is really important. It is heroic. So a couple of months later, I'm in Singapore and I tell uh, you know, 650 people in the audience at the Singapore Banking Association this story. And I said, you guys are heroic. By what you do, it really makes a difference. It protects the bank, but at the same time, it protects people and it results in you know, legal action and so forth. You guys are doing work that is just as important as the NGOs. And I must have had about 30 people come up to me afterwards and say, nobody ever says that to us, but you're right. What we do is heroic. It is helpful. It is making the world a better place. The same thing I say for the manufacturing companies that have auditors that go in. You look at factories, you know, 30 years ago in China versus now, they're so much better because the private sector goes back every year and audits and improves and audits and improves. They are heroic. The point I'm making is oftentimes the private sector is ignored. They are considered to be the problem when, in fact, in many ways, they can be the solution. With that, uh, these are two books that uh, we sell in order to raise money for the causes that I talked about. The Be the Hero book basically talks about volunteerism and how to step up and get involved in things. The Where Were You book uh, basically is a textbook on addressing modern slavery. Uh, they're available on Amazon. And by reading this, uh, you're not only getting the information you need, but you're also contributing to a cause. With that, thank you very much. I'm done. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you.